Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review, part 8, and this is session 80. Uh, this went a little longer than I thought it would when I first did this. I thought it would take me 60 sessions to do this. It's been 80. Do you want us to comment? No, I do not want you to comment. I already know what you're going to say. So, um, but let me just say before we start out here, this is going to be the last uh, Sunday that's going to finish up Romans 11 today. So 80, 81, and 82. I'm sure hoping to get it all in, and I'm, I'm counting on getting it all in. And um, so anyway, uh, I, I need to talk to you at the end of today's session about where we go next. And, and we'll do that at the end. So... Here is where we left off last time. We're looking at Romans eleven twenty eight, And that verse says, As concerning the gospel, they, talking about unsaved Israel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Fathers, plural. We'll get to that second half of the verse in a moment. But when he says, as concerning the gospel, now, you already know he's talking about Paul's gospel, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God. He says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. In other words, they have been made to be enemies so that we could get that gospel. I mean, uh, 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 if, we, if they remained in Israel's program and everything was going right along we'd still be on the other side of the wall of separation and, you know, uh, without hope and without God and all that. So, um, uh, he, has, he has done this with Israel in order to offer salvation to the Gentiles. But, there, but, but there's another way in which they are enemies, and that is they are enemies to that gospel itself. They're absolutely opposed to that gospel. Uh, and by the way, I gave you notes today, but we did not finish up your notes from the last time. So that's, not, that's why it doesn't say session 80 at the top of your notes. Session 80 is going to start with 1 Thessalonians 2.16. We're almost there, but back in the notes I gave you last week. So I don't know what page that's on, but in last week's notes... Well, I'm sorry? 207. So if you'll, if you'll look at that... Uh, that sec at 1 Thessalonians 2.16 verse, that's where we left off. We're fixed to get back there. I'm just reminding us of, of who we were and what's going on there. And I had given you, because we were looking at this verse about them being, a, you know, uh, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but they are also enemies of the gospel, opposed to the gospel. And the verse that we looked at was... 1 Thessalonians 2.14, and we read it up to verse 16. So let's read this one more time. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Now, I want you to notice there's a progression here. They killed their own prophets. We know that. That's not a surprise to us. And not only that, they killed their own Messiah, the Lord Jesus. They rejected him and put him to death. And now Paul says, and they have persecuted us. So the opposition that had started back when their program was in force is continuing even into the dispensation of Gentile grace. And they're opposing Paul and his message concerning Jesus Christ. And so, there's, look, there's some serious consequences to what Israel has been doing. And I want you to see it that way. Because 
when it, it, it got them in the position that they're in today. What is that position today? They're a curse from Christ. They've been cast away. And now they're, they're in it. They've been made to be enemies so that we might get that gospel. They really are enemies of the gospel. Uh, of the gospel. Now we'll pick it up in this last verse because this is where we take up now where we left off in your notes. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. In other words, they didn't want Paul preaching that message. I just remind you, the Jews didn't have a problem talking to Gentiles. Didn't have a problem talking to Gentiles about eternal life. What they wanted is they wanted Gentiles to be proselytes to Judaism. What was Paul preaching? You don't need to be a proselyte to Judaism. Salvation is offered straight to you Gentiles apart from Israel. That's the rub. And so this is what they were forbidding. And he says, that, he says uh, uh, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins all way. And I want you to notice that there is no S on the end of all way. So those two words are very similar. And when you talk about all ways, you're talking about something to do with time. If it's all ways, it's all the time, right? So this is a time issue. If you do it all ways, you do it every time, okay? Now, the word all way... when he says, to fill up their sins alway. There's something a little different about this now, and that has to do with a measure not of time, but of volume. And that's pretty easy to see, because he says, to fill up their sins. Okay, now look, we're going to talk about something we never talked about before. I, at the end of the last session, I couldn't keep quiet about it, so I, I mentioned things to you. But here we are about to study it. There is an issue about judgment that has to do with sins reaching a certain volume. Now, in Israel's program, of course, they were under the law contract. And so, you, you know, if they disobeyed, then they got certain punishments. But the Gentiles were under no such law contract. So when God was going to judge Gentile nations, He was going to do that based on a volume of sin. When their sins came to the full. And so, there's some verses that we're going to look at that, but this is the same principle right here. He says what Israel is doing, unsaved Israel is doing, is in, in forbidding the Gentiles, to, to, for Paul to talk to the Gentiles that they might be saved, they were filling up their sins all the way or all the way to the top or to the f full. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Now... That means that those sins had reached um, a zenith or an apex or a completeness. And so that's the filling up concept. Now, in order to see this, I want you to go with me back to Genesis chapter 15. And here we are. In verse 12, this, of course, is where God is going to make an unconditional covenant with Abraham to make his name great and increase his seed and through his seed, uh, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Those are the three issues of the Abrahamic covenant. But take a look. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. What land is this? This is Egypt, right? He's talking about when Israel is going to go down into Egypt. He said they're going to go down there and they're going to be afflicted for 400 years. Let's keep reading. 
and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. Talk about Abraham's seed. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now I want you to notice what he is saying to him. Why is God waiting for 400 years? Now you can say, while they're down there in Egypt for these 400 years, God is doing some things. As a matter of fact, God even talks about that. He's going to be doing some very important things, not the least of which is some nation building with them. They're small in number, and you realize that as long as they're in Egypt, they're kind of being protected from anyone else that would come along and, and try to wipe them out. But they get afflicted down there in Egypt, but you know what they've done is they've multiplied in number, and they've grown, and they've become a, a, a lot of them. And, and, and because of that, now, God is doing some things with Israel, teaching them about His Jehovahness and grace. He's doing some things with them. But at the same time, He is waiting. Because sitting in the promised land are seven nations. Those seven nations... God is going to judge those nations and He's going to drive them out. You see, you cannot accuse God of um, being unfair or unjust because God does have the right to judge the Gentile nations of the world. He does, and I want, to, I want to show you that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and uh, take a look. And by the way, the Amorites, when I said there's seven nations in the land, that was one of them. Now, Deuteronomy 9, 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. So, by the way, we know who's living in the promised land. I mean, what kind of people? I mean, there's a particular stature of people that are living in the promised land. Yeah, there's giants in the land. And they have great walled cities. But now I want to skip down from verse 1 to verse 5. Not for thy righteousness. Remember what he just told Israel? Back up. He says, you're going to pass over Jordan. You're going to go in and possess these nations that are greater in number and mightier in armies than yourself. They have great fenced cities. And then he says... But not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for, the, I should have put that in yellow, I don't know why I missed it. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, if someone were to ask you, why did God drive out those nations that were in the promised land, what would the answer be? I'm sorry? Yeah, because of their wickedness. That's why God is driving them out. Now you say, but God promised, remember yeah, Abraham walked the length and breadth of that, and he promised this land to him and all, but you realize that in doing that, he didn't give him the land immediately. He didn't give him control, dominion over the land immediately. In fact, when they go down into Egypt, they're small in number. And how long are they down there? Four centuries. I mean, actually, they're afflicted 400 years. They're down there 450 years. And so, the, and, and what is God waiting for? He's waiting them for, for them to become two million people. They're already less in number than the people that are in the land. What he's waiting for is what? You, are, you know this answer. He's waiting because the Amorites are lagging behind the other nations, evidently, in wickedness. Because he says... The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. 
So he's waiting for that. It, isn't that an odd thing? That instead of just arbitrarily doing it, God is waiting for them to fill up their sins. I'm using the terminology now that, that Paul was using over in Romans 11. But once their, their sins come to a full, what is going to follow? Judgment. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, let me take you to another place here. Because this one is found in the book of Daniel. And Daniel has been given a time schedule. It's the 70 weeks prophecy. And one of the things that is told to Daniel is what the 70 weeks are supposed to accomplish. Now, before we look at it, tell me on the timeline, where do the 70 weeks fit in on the timeline? Where do the 70 weeks begin? Thank you. The fifth course of punishment, right here. And the fifth course of punishment starts with what event? Yes, for the southern kingdom, it was when they were carried away captive by the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. That starts the fifth course of punishment. And so what you have is, you have the Babylonian captivity, and then remember, in the midst of that, Daniel's in that captivity, right? He's been carried away to Babylon. And then he's praying to the Lord, and he's saying, is this all there is to it? And God sends an angel to give him an answer, and he says, oh, no, there's actually 70 weeks of years that, that is scheduled for this. And so what you have is, is you have other nations are going to come along. Now look, I don't want to get caught up in that, but let's read this passage now. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now, what's a, I left off the rest of the verse. We're going to read it. But what I want you to get is, there are seventy weeks. We know from the first verse in the chapter, these are weeks of years. So, seventy times seven would be four hundred and ninety years. So what do you have? You have a breakdown of those weeks, but again, here's what I'm after. The 70 weeks are determined upon who? Who is thy people? That's Israel. So this is not about the Gentiles, right? It's important to remember the 70 weeks. In other words, everything that is happening from the Babylonian captivity... And what is the end? What's the end of the 70 weeks? What's the last... I'm giving you the answer. What, the last week, what do we call that? Okay, we call that the tribulation. What else do we call it? I'm sorry? Yeah, Daniel's 70th week. What else do we call it? Day of wrath? What else do we call it? Are you pointing at your mom? Did she say it? What did you say, Ruby? She forgot. <laughs> the time... of Jacob's trouble. Why Jacob's trouble? Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes. Okay. So, yeah, these, these were, now, I, there's some nuance to these terms. I understand that. But all of these are describing either the whole or part of that last week. So everything from the Babylonian captivity to the tribulation is meant to accomplish six things. And if I recall what I said to you, I don't even remember if this was on the tape or not, 
But I think when we were talking after the session was over, remember I sat down on that table and we talked for another, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm just saying that because I wanted the people that are watching this to know we did something they didn't get to see. <laughs> I think I mistakenly said five. There's, a, there's six. I, I, I don't remember if I got it right or not. Anyway, so here, here, so here it is. So this, let's read the rest of the verse now. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. What is that? Ah, so here's what you have. You have the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. The 70 weeks are supposed to accomplish something there. The 70 weeks of years are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to, and here we go, number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sin. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And number six, to anoint the most holy. Now, I want to focus on the first two because those are the ones that pertain to the subject that we're talking about. What is the subject that we're talking about? That Paul was talking in Romans 11 about Israel is going to fill up their sins all the way. There's going to be a fullness. In other words, the bucket is full. And, and remember we went over to Thessalonians and saw that, that principle over there. First Thess I said that in Romans 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may fill up their sins all way. And where did that come from? That out of Romans 11 where Paul's talking about their enemy, concerning the gospel, their enemies for your sakes. They really were opposed to that gospel. And, 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 and because of that, okay, so, when he, so let's talk about these first two. So what, what, is, the, what is the tribulation? Now, what is the entire... Because if you're talking about the 70 weeks, you're really talking about the fifth course of punishment, right? Isn't that where we started right here? Right here, here's the first installment, the second installment, the third installment, the fourth installment, and this one, it didn't come out on this chart because of the black background and, and the computer didn't print it out, but. It's the fifth, that's the fifth installment. All of that is for the purpose of accomplishing those six things. But the first two have a direct connection with the issue that we're talking about right now. And by the way, they're probably the hardest to identify. And I'm going to tell you some things today that are going to seem hard to believe. But we're going to look at the scripture about them as we discuss these two. So obviously, you know, I've never taught this to you, uh, to you before. So here, here's what's going to happen. Let's talk about to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. To make an end of sins. Well now, I mean logically we understand what that is. To just bring sin to an end for Israel, right? I mean, that's really what, he, what he's trying to do here. And, and what's going to accomplish this? This whole thing. This whole thing is going to accomplish this. But God is going to... Uh, what's the word that I want to use here? Um... The judgments that come through on Israel, they're pretty severe, but when they get to the end, they're the most severe, yes? Why, why would God ever punish Israel? What's the real motive? To get them to turn and do the right thing, yes. The severity 
I, I'm not sure we really understand, but the severity of the judgments that are falling out here at the end in Daniel's 70th week are of such magnitude. They are, what's the, what's the, I, I, I'm trying to think of a word. They are, they are apocalyptic. But when you think of that, don't, doesn't it make you think, of, they're so severe, they're so, well, okay, look, I, I know we're talking about it. Look at this verse in Luke, Luke 21. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Now wait, think about that. What's the picture you get in your mind when you hear the waves and the sea roaring? Okay, you're, th you're thinking it'd be like a hurricane is coming through something. Things are happening on the earth that are causing traumatic events, right? So it's not just happening in the heavens, in the sun and the moon and the sun, but it's also happening on the earth. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Now you're talking about people dropping dead from fright at what they're seeing. Even though we're reading it and I'm talking to you in very graphic language about that, I, I assure you in, in 30 seconds it'll all be gone out of your mind. And it, it, but, but, but to be in it would be the most horrific thing to be in in the history of this world. What is God doing with those judgments? You said it yourselves a while ago. Those judgments are meant to turn Israel from sin to God. And the purpose, the first two purposes, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. The reason for the judgments is to make people finally look at what they have gone after all this time instead of looking at God and say, we're through with that. I'm finished with that. You ever had somebody that ever got to... Uh, I, 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 this is not going to be anything in real comparison, but ha, have you ever had such a problem with an item or with a situation that finally you just said to yourself, I'm finished with that. I'm not fooling with it anymore. I'm done. I don't want, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. This is too much trouble. And I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about an, an appliance that didn't work or a... But, you know, Milt was talking to me about his lawnmower and all the stuff he was... I would just shoot it is what I would do. But, you know, but, you know, this is where God is going with this. Okay, just hold right there. We'll let Mark reset the tape and we'll pick this right back up.